Ferrara has now made 56 studio recordings of complete operas. Alongside that, there is also an extensive program of curated recital discs featuring some of the great singers of the bel canto period. We haven't made a recital disc for many years and it seemed to me that we had a great opportunity to work with two of the current great bel canto singers of today, Michael Spires and Joyce El Curry. Joyce and Michael had starred in our opera rara recording of Les Martyrs by Donizetti, and then the idea came that we'd like to do solo discs with both of them, and it came into my mind that uh, Les Martyrs was premiered by these two very famous French singers, uh, Julie de Rue Gras and uh, Gilbert Dupré. And so we thought, well, why not form each individual solo disc on the work of those two singers? And it seemed to me that we had a great opportunity to showcase their extraordinary talents in these two recital discs that we are recording today. So there's quite a bit of well-known repertory by Donizetti and Rossini, etc. But um, actually what was most fascinating for me was we had the opportunity, as we're just doing individual arias and duets, to do some absolutely unknown repertory, operas that have literally never been performed. Uh, when you do recordings, uh, you know, with uh, unknown pieces, uh, uh, in a way there is a, an enormity of repertoire to choose from because uh, there are many, many operas that uh, have not been performed since, uh, since the time. Well, the repertoire selection, as always at Opera Rara, is a fascinating process. Um, it is, if you like, that process of musical archaeology, of musical restoration, but absolutely with a view to selecting, curating a repertoire which is going to appeal to a 21st century audience today. And that was absolutely fascinating for me, I have to say, this process of discovery of of, of thinking about whether these pieces would work or not, then for making editions of them, and then finally listening to the recording in the end. It was just an incredible experience of discovery. So the fascinating thing about Dupre was that he had such a varied career. He started off in France as a light tenor singing Rossinian works. Then he moved to Italy, was uh, very much influenced by Donizetti and started singing much heavier, more demanding Italian roles. And then a third phase, he comes back to France and sings again at the Opéra in Paris, much heavier still. So he's, he's kind of the career you know goes from from stage to stage him getting more and more famous um, but also singing as a very different kind of tenor as he evolved <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, uh, what we do know about him is that uh, he changed uh, the trajectory of what the tenor singer was forever. Um, and the interesting thing, especially f for, for me, when researching this disc and trying to find the right uh, music, was how sweet and sentimental and, and beautiful nearly all of the, the, the things that were written for him. <laughs> His uh, kind of USP, if you want, were these sort of mixed high notes that he could do, uh, which weren't exactly falsetto, which the earlier tenors had done, and weren't a real voce di petto, is what the Italians called, not a real screamed note, but a kind of mixed note. And he could do that up to an extremely high register, high Fs, high E's, which Michael loves doing himself. So it was a fantastic, almost every aria has one of these stratospheric notes in it. So it's a marvelous sort of marriage between the technique of Dupre and the technique of, of Michael. There is this, uh, this thing uh, that uh, some people, some purists think that the uh, high notes are sort of uh, sinful. Uh, you know, they're not sinful. High notes are part uh, of music. Uh, and particularly if you have singers that can do it very well, why not? It depends always how you do it. I think it's going to be fantastic for people to understand Dupre because uh, you you you'll you'll hear through through the course of the ten or eleven pieces that are going to be recorded that uh, six or seven of them are the the most beautiful and uh, and and delicate pieces. But then you have three or four that are just absolutely all romance and 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 about uh, two steps higher than the romantic period would write in. So it's a it's a very very thrilling uh, project for me and. To get to to actually record this music that I, I've sung quite a few of these these roles already on stage, uh, it's it's an absolute dream for me. That's the key. It took years and years and years to figure out how to manage the passaggio. And the funny thing is, is that until I was about uh, 21, 22, I started my career as a baritone. And I would just fake these tenor voices, and it was it was actually a falsetto, and I just, oh, and um, once in a while I could get a really good uh, voix mix. And one of my friends, who was a one of these natural tenors, said, I don't know, you you. You could probably become a tenor. And I said, oh man, I don't know. Back then, you know, I like to talk like this as a baritone. It took years and years and years of, uh, of trying to figure out how do you mask this, this major gear shift and the changes that, that have to happen.
Yeah, I think the, the match between Michael's voice and Dupre's is fundamentally this extreme flexibility that they have. I mean, Michael could sing, has sung as a baritone in his early career and can go down to the lower regions and be really forceful. But also there's no end to the top notes. Uh, he doesn't have a problem up there and he doesn't get particularly tired doing it so he can carry on reproducing these notes. So it's this flexibility over an enormous range, which I really can't think of another tenor who has that at the moment. Every, every person has to find it themselves, to be honest, because if you read in books about how to mask the passaggio, um, well, maybe now with modern times we can, we can do it with all of the technology we have with the MRI and, uh, and the spectrograms of uh, being able to see the actual uh, the voice and the overtones. Uh... So you can hear the, the yeah, difference, and it, it just it depends on the, on the mouth resonance. But um, as I said, the, this is one of the most interesting things to me because uh, it, it helped me learn and figure out um, the, the, the minute changes that you have to have, especially in the really, really high stuff, because mids and lows was never, ever a problem for me when I was a, a younger singer. And then everything just felt like, I was just faking everything up above. And I felt like Mickey Mouse, basically. But then um, I started getting into overtone singing and started realizing that the, the minute changes that you have, especially in the higher register, uh, as with this Dupre, which is some of the highest written music, you, you can <clears throat> very slightly manipulate tiny, tiny little uh, bits in order to find a, find a root into your, to your high notes. very important part of singing is visualizing and painting these kind of ideas of what you're doing because uh, uh, otherwise um, it just all becomes mechanics and you don't have any feeling to your instrument. But, but I think there's the, there's the side of science and art that has to converge in order to become a really good singer. So, well, that's, that's my hope anyways, and that's what I'm teaching other people. So. Doru Gra was, was, was interesting in the sense that she came from rather lowly beginnings in all sorts of ways and had gradually to establish herself and it wasn't until relatively late that she got onto the, the really top stages and that was probably a reason why she was so secure in her vocal technique, that she didn't do things too quickly, too fast, that she gradually learnt 
um, how to do the less demanding roles and then came up to the big ones. And she obviously was sensible about conserving her voice, not singing too much, which a lot of singers in those days did. So she ended up having a really a quite extended career um, at the highest level, which is quite unusual for those times. but I, I certainly am thinking of her quite a bit. If I could go back, it would have been in the 1830s and early 40s when she was premiering these pieces to see what she was like, what she was like to work with and how she studied her music and what her voice sounded like and wondering if it's in any way similar to mine. Um, because I, I'm singing her repertoire, and so we have, we must have something in common in terms of the, you know, the mechanism of the, the way the throat works. One of, the, one of the great things about Julie Dorougras and Joyce is that they both had an incredible kind of flexibility um, in terms of the fact that they were obviously powerful sopranos and could do highly dramatic roles, but they also had flexibility to do a lot of coloratura. It's a very rare mixture to get those two things together. She obviously had a huge palette of colors that she could access. And whatever it was she did, there was always flexibility. There, there's coloratura, and there's ornamentation, and then there's long, hefty legato line. I think she was able to do anything. It would be a real dream come true for me to hear what she sounded like. Yeah, so this idea of matching Julie de Rougras with uh, Joyce L. Curry has been an incredible adventure for me, actually, a really exciting one, uh, discovering these roles that de Rougras created and seeing whether they'd suit Joyce's voice. And I think also it's been an adventure for Joyce, sort of measuring herself against this famous singer from the past. It's been a, a tremendous journey for all of us. Is, is all about line and legato, but not only technically speaking, the vowels are what carries the emotion. And so when you, when you take the emotion and you marry it to the musical phrase, and then you just go, then that's bel canto in its most exciting form.
So Gilbert Louis Dupre and uh, Julie Dorugra sang together in big premieres in France. They did Donizetti's Les Martyrs, they did Berlioz's Benvenuto Cellini, they did these lesser known works by L.A.V. Um, so they were very, very used to each other. In fact, there was a story going around that they always sang better when they were together. Um, but of course, they didn't sing the entire repertory together. They were both famous for singing Lucia di Lammermoor, but they never sang it together. So we put them together on this disc just to imagine what it might have been like. Sulla tomba che rinserra il tradito genitore al tuo sangue eterna guerra io giurai nel mio furore ma ti vidi in cuor minacqua al trofetto eliata I'm very excited to, to, to sing two, two duets uh, with uh, Joyce Alcuri and one is the Lucia duet, uh, the very long scene which is about ten and a half minutes and fantastic because uh, we're going to do it come scritto, so I'm going to be singing some, some high E flats, so, so close those ears when you get there, you know, it's going to be kind of loud. Um, <laughs> That's the thing about about bel canto and um, especially something like Lucia, where the the phrasings are so delicate, um, and the devil's really in the detail, and so you have to really be connected to your colleagues. And in this case, um, Michael and I respond really well to each other, and we have a kind of a subliminal conversation and Maestro Rizzi is, is listening to us and communicating with us and uh, so it kind of just gels and um, I, that's, that's what makes it exciting. Many people aren't used to hearing um, her her earthy, wonderful, uh, round sound in a, in a Lucia because most Lucias uh, nowadays uh, have become very light coloraturas. And funny enough, Joyce started like me. She started as a mezzo and then turned into a soprano and had to learn the high just like me. And so we've we've had very similar paths in our in our in our vocal careers. And uh, so we understand each other quite well. It's tremendously exciting because because Michael's and Joyce's voice voices blend so well that in a sense having Lucia there at the center is a perfect realization of that. Both of the artists are making their solo disc for the first time and again it's fantastic that they've chosen to do that with Opera Rara. Um, both artists speak very movingly and extremely eloquently about the impact that Opera Rara has had on their careers and so I think it's natural, it's, it's fitting and it's entirely appropriate that they should be making their debut recital discs with us. Look I, I, I started out uh, my career uh, when I was 19 and in the Midwest and and for the most part you you only get to hear Mozart, Puccini, Verdi. Those are the three composers that anybody gets a chance to possibly hear. And then when I was uh, 
in my studies, my two years that I went to university, they had these wonderful, uh, very, very first CDs of uh, Opera Lara that they had put out. And I just started listening to them, um, some of the, uh, the, the, the CDs, and I, I, a whole world opened up to me. And Opera Lara was the, the label that I said, someday, you know, I mean, gosh, this was 19 years ago, someday I want to record with him. <laughs> and it's, it's bizarre. I just feel like I'm living a dream. This is a project I think that could only have been done by Opera Rara, and that's why it's important that Opera Rara did it. I don't think the kinds of resources required to do all this research and to take this much care with thinking about these discs is going to happen in the normal run of uh, making recordings, solo recordings. So we took incredible risks here, and that's why we're, that's why we're in the business. Of course, we therefore have an artistic responsibility to make sure that is done to the very highest artistic standards. That's why we're working with the Halle, one of the greatest orchestras in the world. It's why we're working with Carlo Rizzi, one of the greatest bel canto conductors in the world. And also, it's why we're working with Joyce L. Curry and Michael Spires, who for us are the two singers who are absolutely ready to record this work for future and current audiences to enjoy. Hello.